Christina said that uh, I feel like probably everybody in this room knows Joel quite well. I have a sense that you can't look at Joel Knapp's paintings without knowing Joel Knapp because he really puts himself into his paintings. It's, it's just it's who he is. Joel uses lively color with oil paint in an impressionistic style to capture a feeling of time and place as he sees it. He's a painter in motion, and if you've ever painted with him, you know that's absolutely true. He'll wear you out in about five minutes' time. <laughs> he is a, a devoted plein air painter who feels that the essence of the place may only be captured by the artist experiencing it directly. He may be found traveling in his camper with easel and paints deployed in front of mountains, rivers, and landscapes of all types in cities, painting sidewalks, cafes, and cityscapes. Of plain air painting, he says, it is such an honest approach to see the light as it hits the scene. The wind in your face, the flies in your paint, and two hours to create a painting. One must paint fast and loose. You'll experience that today. A couple of highlights. Joel has recently published two books about his paintings. First, Painting by Joel Knapp in 2008, and Painting Tennessee, Portraits of Tennessee's 95 Counties, uh, in collaboration with uh, other artists, Thomas Moore, Jennifer Simpkins, which is also published in 2008. Joel has uh, participated in the Indiana Heritage Arts Show, the Hooser, excuse me, that's hard for me to say, Hoosier Salon Show, where he received the Purchase Award because his painting was entered and sold through the show. Currently, he is represented by All About Art Gallery here in Hendersonville and uh, one of the leading galleries in Nashville, Indiana. Plus the fact, and I, I guess I kind of knew this, but it slipped my mind, Joel did all the paintings that now hang in the governor's ballroom in the governor's mansion. Please give a nice welcome to Joel Knapp. Thank you. Uh, Indiana, they, they'd yell in the woods, uh, hey, and the guy'd say, who was there? And it became, who's your daughter? <laughs> I'm from Indiana, and uh, uh, I've been here about 35 years, now, but I still paint with the group down there, too. And, uh, you know, we're talking about this group. Uh, when I came here, I'd been with a group in Indiana, and uh, Sharon Shaver, a patient of mine in Hendersonville, we got together and started this in about 79, 1979. And this is the best it's ever run. And we never had programs like this before. And our, our groups in Indiana, uh, maybe one a year, uh, I find that you can learn from anybody. I took a course two weeks ago in Indiana from a painter I like just because I wanted to work on color, color theory. And I will paint at least one plein air a day. And um, the plein air painting is the topic of the, of the presentation today. Um, plein air painting on a small canvas will teach you more than you realize. And uh, you, can get, you can go about it pretty inexpensively. This is one of the boxes that I made that I use to plein air paint. I just put this together myself and uh, holds the painting, and it'll hold two paintings in here wet. Uh, I like this one just for me. I just take this out in the woods with some paper towel in my pocket. That's it. Nothing else to carry. And you can do two small paintings. And if you can get this small painting done, and it doesn't, you're not going out in the woods and uh, trying to get a finished product. You're trying to capture uh, that song, or that magic, or that mystery of, of what you're standing in front of. And so you just paint it kind of quick and loose, and you don't really worry. Paint the big things, the little things take care of themselves. And then I put these up in the kitchen for a week, and then I will pick one to do a big painting out of. Because half the work's done with the color combination. Now this, if you really wanted to go cheap, this is a box I got at Hobby Lobby. And it's about two bucks. And you can glue a little piece of wood here like this and uh, 
take a piece of masonite or board, and put wax paper in here, and put this on your lap, you're painting. And uh, it really works easy, because a lot of people are afraid to get involved with a lot of expense when they get started, and this really makes it cheap. I'm going to use an inbox. This is called an open inbox. Uh, today, just because it's up and you can see it better, and, and I got more mixing space, you know, a little finder like this, and look through it, you know, figure out what part of the scene you want to paint. And then you got to get it on this little tiny canvas and make sure that uh, you say something uh, on here. And if you took a big 16 by 20 or uh, even 11 by 14 out in the woods like that, uh, unless you're, I, I take bigger ones for competition. If there's going to be a, a two hour paint off or something, um, I would take a bigger one because it impresses the judges better. You have a little <laughs> bigger scene and a little tiny thing to look at. Uh, but you can use a lot of paint up, a lot of time. Paint's expensive, you know. Um, and if you don't get your colors right, what are you going to do with it? You know, uh, of course, people always think they're going to sell everything they paint. But the little ones just make sense to paint because uh, they make nice little Christmas gifts and things <laughs> like that, you know. And uh, I take my studies. I might do... Uh, seven or eight studies a week, and I'll just save them somewhere, and if I don't use them to uh, make a big painting, I'll just send them to a gallery without a frame, and they sell them there. You know, I mean, I sell them for like 150, 100 bucks a piece, and I don't have any trouble getting rid of them. Just go in and ask for the manager, and ask them if he trade me for wine and, about, and a meal, <laughs> and they do. Because a lot of, where are you gonna get somebody to paint your restaurant? Yeah. In, you know, so that works. Uh, I also made a little box like this that goes in. This is all I eat. This is where I keep my my uh, water and paints and uh, put that. All that folds up and goes in there. And then I take this little box I made. It'll hold two wet paintings. So that's all you really need. Walk into the woods and uh, you're ready to go. Now today. Uh, I asked people to bring some paintings in. I wanted to, uh, it's kind of dangerous for an artist just to go in without planning. You know, if you, if you would fail to plan, plan to fail. You know? And so I, a lot of times when I do demos, I would do it at home and pick out what I wanted and all. But I thought it's kind of fun just to get something that I haven't seen before and then try to figure it out. Uh, you have to be careful though because uh, the hardest paintings to paint, I think, are like people like sunsets, you know, waterfalls. Uh, it's tough sometimes. Even rocks, a lot, of, a lot of rocks in the stream. I mean, if you're gonna paint something quickly, it's harder, it, it takes a little more time. And even uh, some barns. And especially cows. Cows are, to me, cows are tough. They've always given me a hard time. Uh, I like the really impression. I wanted something with a little color in it, and I wanted to show how you cut, cut it off to, to select what you want to paint. What I wanted to, to tell, tell you is when you're out there and you're looking at this scene, um, did you wade in there, or how did you get that picture? There's actually a bridge. Oh, is there a bridge? Yeah, over the park. Okay. You would squint down. This is one of the most important things to say. And I used to write on my, my uh, easel, squint, because what you're going to do with a painting like this is paint shapes. Just think of things as shapes. And put the shapes in and uh, get the values correct, and the values light and, light and dark. This has a lot of nice colors. Now sometimes you can be overwhelmed with uh, colors in the fall. I like to paint more when the leaves are just about off or when they first start. And then in, in the summer, everything's green, so it's really tough 
you've got to find all these subtleties in green paintings. And you can see some of them that I've done there uh, that summer. I tried to get the seasons there for you. Those are all done from the little paintings that I did. The first one was from Indiana, from a state park that I go to there. The middle one's from back of my house in Joel Hollow. It's a creek that dumps into station camp. And then the third one was uh, a little field that I found in the state park where I did a quick painting. And if you do these little paintings quickly like this in your box, your spouse doesn't mind sitting around and doing nothing for 30 or 40 minutes, you know, because that's long enough to keep on not wanting to go with you again. So, <laughs> and I'd have to say if I squinted this down, it would be almost like a burnt sienna, a reddish brown type thing, which makes a good painting. It, it's hard to sell all green paintings, you know, but brown paintings, and, and it's hard to paint, uh, hard to sell a lot of fall paintings because the colors sometimes are so vivid and uh, bright that uh, it makes a person more nervous. You, you want to give them, you want to put something in their house that makes them tranquil and calm and uh, makes them feel good because an artist is, is a healer just like the musician or anybody that works with, with photography and all. If a person looks at your work and it makes them feel good, boy, that's what else could you ask for? Mm -hmm. So you think of that when you do your work. It doesn't have to be a great piece of work. Sometimes you can have uh, one of your kids come home from school and did a painting at school just with some acrylics and happen to put the colors down so neat. I mean, it didn't have to be in line or anything, but the colors vibrated. That's great painting. Yeah. So what would I do here? I think I would go uh, more land than, than sky because it's about the trees. So I would probably, if this is half the canvas, and I'll step back again after I draw it, I think it's about half. I would, uh, and, and you don't have to make it like this picture. I took some pictures on my iPad, and uh, I like to paint from my iPad because uh, the colors are almost like painting from uh, uh, a slide. And it had a barn in here, and it's just a nice, comfortable little scene. And you know, the paint's still wet, but I'll pass it around so you can see it. But when I got it, when I was painting it, I had to decide what was going to be the focal point. Sometimes I don't do the focal point to the end, because I'm not sure what it's going to be or where I'm going to put it. A lot of people say you got to have your focal point first, or, you know, that's your special thing. But I don't think so. So anyway, I had this all done, but I didn't have this tree in it, the dark tree. And I had the roof darker. So I was eating my oatmeal this morning and looked at that and said, I bet it needs a tree there just for balance and all. I put the tree in and it changed the picture and helped the picture. Now with this picture right here, I could make this a spring picture, a fall picture, or a winter picture because it has, it has balance and enough interesting things in it that it would do all three. I'm going to make a uh, 30 by 40 out of this picture. And uh, I think it'll work. Uh, I have uh, four foot by six foot paintings. And I went, uh, when I was doing the book, uh, Painting Tennessee, we went to all the counties and I did little paintings like this. And then I went back and did the big ones because I wasn't going to stand there all day. I had to get to a lot, that's a lot of counties, a lot of counties, and a long way away. But I turned my six by eight painting into a four, or six foot, four by six painting. And they, they worked out well. I did, um, what was the name of that soldier's? Bernie Pyle. No, it's a, uh, what's the soldier that captured all the Germans? Down in York. York, Sergeant York Mill, and uh, did that one, and I did a, a big creek scene, almost like that middle one, but more yellow. So it was all scenes around Tennessee, but all done from these little paintings. Because why waste time with, with doing big ones? What was it? 
course once and the guy said, there's more of a problem solving in painting than there, he says, more trickery and chicanery in doing a painting than there is of robbing a bank. <laughs> you know, to figure out, you know, what, what you know, how you're going to change things. And that always keeps your mind active, you know, it's a problem to solve wherever you go. And it's really kind of fun. I mean, you do this your whole life, and you never, you never get what you want. You never get just kidding, you know. And, and when you start painting, it's almost like weaving uh, thread, getting the colors together. Like I'm gonna put this in. I probably gonna put it a little less than half. And. Uh, talk and ask questions while I'm doing this, I don't care. <clears throat> you know, that's how, that's what I would do to start it, just anybody would, would do that, you know, it's not a big deal, just put down your dark. I don't use a lot of turf. Uh, I seldom wash my brush. Joel, I assume that since you have limited mixing space on, on your paint box when you're out in plain air, that you use a limited palette also? No, I use the same amount. I use the same paints on that. I just use a little smaller. Yeah. yeah, I did this so I could mix quickly and try to speed up the time, but now that I'm talking, it's probably going to end up like that. I use black, I like black. Black makes a great color for a sky, it makes a great green, makes great grays. Good color. And if you use it without it mixing anything else in it though, you have to put some uh, varnish on it because it dries kind of flat. I 
this tree is not in here. Well, it's in here, but it's a different kind of tree. I'm just kind of putting in a different tree. I don't need a whole lot of different brushes. So there's another phase putting in the darks. Um, if, and if anybody wants to wander up here and look through, you can do that. You just have to do a paper towel. putting the dark greens in first. The picture will look a little dark to start with. After a while, I'll put my uh, other colors in. So I'll put a few greens. Back, back in the distance, uh, that's a tricky area. I like to put, even though that's all red back there and yellow, if I put that those bright colors back there, uh, it's going to jump right out of the canvas. So, I'm going to put a, a, a bluish color to make, this, to make this go back, to receive back in the picture. If I put red or orange there, red's very warm, and it'll come right out after you in your eye. So, you know, you stuff, so. I, I may change some of these too, but that's just for now. And then there's some grays in this uh, in this water, which I'll put the darks in first. Wash them a little bit. And you can mix right on your canvas. I mean, don't be afraid to mix the paint right on the canvas. You don't have to mix it on your palette. the carrier back there, uh, we go out a lot in the woods and paint this way. Uh, we've got a small box. I used to go to, uh, I used to teach a lot and I just don't anymore. Uh, my son would make these little boxes like I have up there. and. Uh, I'd get ready to start teaching and everybody would be bringing, you know, stuff in my suitcases on rollers and stuff and one in each hand and all this material. <laughs> so I just come up with that little box and uh, by the end of the course, I sold everybody a little box. <laughs> <laughs> so there are a lot of boxes out there, but most of them are in the end. I used to teach a lot in Tennessee. I uh, had a friend, Roger Brown with his name, we used to teach uh, double courses together, you know, he, we both do a demo and, and then uh, we took a lot of courses all over the United States together, but uh, he moved to Nashville, I don't see him hardly at all anymore, he used to work in Tennessee, in Anderson. Now I'm going to the uh, sky color just, just to get it in, I'm just sort of uh, rubbing some color in and uh, you know if you're you're thinking like a computer almost if you're going to be using oranges uh, you know what's the compliment what, what color do you want next to orange or if you want to put yellow in what makes it pop if you want to put something next to it and all these kind of things you're thinking about from what you know about color color harmony I'm going to put a little uh, lizard, or not lizard, a little cerulean blue up in that sky too. And I can all, the nice thing about oil paint is that it's made to paint over. 
So if you don't like the color, you can go right over it with a different color. Especially if you have some soft brushes. What were those made out of, Jerry? Again, uh, mongoose? Yeah, mongoose. It's always good. I have, I have a couple on my thing here. And sometimes I will uh, be in a palette, you know, you get different moods. Sometimes I'll be in a palette knife mood and uh, I'll do the painting in a palette knife, really thick. Now uh, you, you can see how, how I'm roughing it in, and, uh, but still trying to do it in patterns, you know, one, two, three, sort of just three patterns. And when you think in patterns like that, uh, you don't start putting in a little detail. Now I'm thinking about uh, what color to make the tree. I don't want to get too bright, but I want to have some color in there. So I'm going to put a little orange mixed with uh, burnt sienna or transparent rock, red oxide, whichever one you like better. Oh. So I put I put a little here. I wanted to have a little land back here where you could go to, you know, it makes it look a little further away. And I started some greens in here. And all these colors I have in here, um, it's like weaving a blanket. Um, some of those colors will be left in there with other colors on top of them so they want to vibrate against each other. I'm going to use a little more yellow ochre back in the back because it is full. Now you see how um, this is like really nothing just stroky kind of things, but you could actually kind of visualize that those are trees back there. It's just really a shape, the shape of the woods way back in there because you would see it when you were squinting down. What do you use to make things recede or come forward? Do you use temperature? Yeah, mainly temperature. And how do you do that? What is it? Well, you know, I would use something blue or purple for uh, distant hills and woods. In the back. Now you can mix, you can mix some other colors in there with it. Uh, you know, put some yellows and greens in as long as you blew them up good, uh, because you want to keep those colors soft and uh, in the distance. Otherwise, they'll come right out of you. Now I'm, got, I'm thinking about a focal point now, and I told you in the drawing that I like the idea. Here, here's my darkest dark and my lightest light. And I think I'm going to try using that as a focal point. Now, if I get this home and I sit in my kitchen after a while and look at it, uh, I may change my mind and put the focal point somewhere else. You can get, you can get in such a, uh, well, you, you get such passion out in the woods when you see the beautiful sight, you know, and the sun comes through and all, that uh, you just go for broke and you're, mix you're not mixing paint with brains at that point and then find out, whoa, I put a tree in the middle of the painting or something else and usually my wife will find out and say, that tree is in the middle of the painting. And I say, thank you, dear, for telling me that. <laughs> A wonderful person. <laughs> you know that there was a, mo a movie about a muse. You remember anybody seeing that? The guy would hire a muse and he'd have to live with her and 
he was writing a book or something, she would uh, help him stay on track. So that's what my wife is and views for me. <laughs> She's on her computer and I'm yelling, could you come in and look at this real quick? So she gets her exercise <laughs> running in the other room, come and see me work and she'll either say, mm -hmm. I'm not too excited about it. <laughs> and I'll say, get out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna carry this a lot farther, but just to show you what it already could hold as, you know, what I'm trying to do with uh, uh, the shapes. Yeah, and, and, and you could stop right here if you wanted to, and, and if the light was right, catch another, do another scene in the woods. In different parts of the room and stuff, it hits these corners, and uh, it'll look different in different kind of light. That's what, uh, what was that fellow that died, all his paintings, he had different lighting on him? Kincaid. He had a, um, I don't know if any of you have been to Nashville, Indiana. Has anybody been there? It's the greatest art colony. I mean, it was started back in the 1810 or something. Anyway, a lot of the artists from Chicago Art Institute went there and lived, and they got famous painters that were there. Um, T.C. Steele was one of them, and then they, had, they just had tons of them. And anyway, if you go there, they've got art studio, art galleries all over. They're really nice, and uh, it's a great place to paint. You'd think you were in Gallatin. Architecture. Uh, Nashville is west of I-65, or the east of I-65, in San Rodas, Columbus, which is a form of uh, an incredible collection of uh, really high-end architecture. You can get a tour to go through there, can't you? Yes. And that's a great place. A lot of great people from uh, Indiana and Tennessee. A lot of people don't remember, know that Red Skelton is from Indiana. Mm -hmm. A lot of people, too, will let you paint on their property. Yes, Place in Gallatin you're talking about. It's the old um, woman's house. Howard? No. Yeah. It's it over by, not down from the library. Yeah. Going down towards the hospital. It's a big building there. Real mm -hmm. big building and it's real old. Mm -hmm. On the big. right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, it's on the right if you're going down towards the hospital. Mm -hmm. Yes. And that was where the people that taught the school for the women lived back in the 1850s or 40s. Or did they close down? So it is closed, it's not a real small. Well, I'm not sure who closed it, but they did. I think it got flooded pretty bad. I'm not going to do a lot of picking on this to and I think try to then, finish um, it a little more. Well, it worked out fine. Because you can, you know, we you had any time you wanted to, make it look a little more interesting. Joy, well, you told us what type of surface you're doing your study on. But when you do your big 30 by 40s, what type of do you do it on a stretched canvas or? Well, I usually use the same stuff. Okay. 
I might use the masonite. All the ones that the uh, governor's placed there in masonite. Mm -hmm. It's light, and I used to. I started painting some of the big stuff when mm -hmm. I got hired to make do all the paintings mm -hmm. for uh, a restaurant chain in the United States, and I started using the masonite. Really liked it. Well, anyway, they got restaurants all over the place, so I would paint on that, and that way I could, I mailed them in mattress boxes, and that's how I bought my first camper. Thank you. 